major indices continued their sell-off for a second day as volatility continues to rattle the markets. Despite a glowing United States jobs report for the month of February, markets still tumbled at the opening bell this morning, with many pointing out that February's numbers do not actually reflect the more recent and critical economic fallout from the illness. More troubling still on the back of this week's failed market rebound is that United States 10-year T-note yield has now dropped to 0.73, suggesting that investors are indeed crowding at the exits. Bitcoin, however, is ending the week bullish above 9,000. After last week's dump down to the mid $8,000 bottom, Bitcoin has held its gains from yesterday's rally and now has to overcome the $9,400,000 price level for the next major charge upwards. Altcoin markets were largely a mixed bag, with one notable exception of Hedera Hashgraph, which we covered yesterday, posting another substantial 25% rally on the day, up over 100% on the week. Despite the fear and uncertainty in the air, opportunity is abound for traders ready to overcome market conditions to their advantage. Find out how the professionals play today on Breaking Bitcoin. Hey, I'm Cap. I'm Karloff. And we're with Particle.io, and this is Breaking, Breaking Bitcoin. Bitcoin! Welcome back to Breaking Bitcoin, recorded live from the underground bunker in the cracking cryptocurrency studio. Recording live for you Friday, March 6th, 2020. This is your daily source for market updates, sentiment, and news for traders. I hope everyone watching today on YouTube, Twitch, DLive, which is now fixed, Facebook Live, and of course on Roku with the Investor News Channel app is doing fantastic. Make sure to support the show if you enjoy the content. Hit the notification bell. Turn on all subscriptions because subscriptions don't really seem to count much for here on YouTube. If you enjoy the content, please smash up the like button, guys. We've got a fantastic show for you guys today. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram to stay up to date. If you have any questions, please drop them in the live chat. The moderators will direct my attention to them in the Q and A segment. So let's just recap what we've seen this week. We've seen one of the biggest Biggest candles on the SPY in recent history, $1.1 trillion on the day for the S&P 500, largest economic recovery in recent history, but almost immediately being sold into as investors crowd toward the exit door, T-note yield moving down. A lot of excitement out there for ETF traders, for CFD traders, and for cryptocurrency traders as altcoins uh now that we have access to a lot of margin on these altcoins, a lot of short selling opportunities, a lot of opportunities for individuals to buy reduced and cheap prices. We've talked about this. Bitcoin obviously finally putting in some good tradable volatility with the close of the bottom feeder trade for us. Now just simply holding Bitcoin spot long and waiting for the next significant market movement as we continue to trade the Forex markets, which have continued to see incredible volatility, uh, value dropping against the dollar, value dropping against the cab. Um, which uh, I kind of talked about, excuse me, not that I kind of talked about, which I talked about last night in my market analysis that went out to premium members. So we've got a fantastic, exciting few weeks ahead of us. Let's not forget that we are leading up into the happening. So a lot of bullish fundamentals, a lot of work, not a lot of work, but some work for Bitcoin to do to really regain these bullish levels and show off that it is acting as a hedge, of course, moving inversely right now to traditional markets. So really, we do not have the objective data that Bitcoin is being viewed as investors as a solid hedge against a deflationary economic event. That is something that could be global illness, so let's say, uh, so that we don't get demonetized here on YouTube. But uh, there are a lot of exciting times ahead. And as I said yesterday, this is the most exciting time to be alive. Some of the greatest opportunities are out here. And all I can counsel you to do is to not be afraid. If you become afraid, if you allow your emotions to make decisions for you, if you allow yourself to react irrationally like the rest of the market, you will end up making the wrong decisions at the wrong time. If you need, if you haven't put in the work, now is the time to do it. Establish your watch lists, establish your strategies, divine exactly how you are going to take advantage of this. But whatever you do, stay cool, calm and collected and understand that in moments of max maximum pain in the market, moments of maximum fear, moments of maximum greed is often when the greatest opportunities will avail themselves 
to the trader, to the investor who is savvy and who can allow his logical decisions and strategy to guide his actions and not his irrational emotions. With that being said, guys, let's go find some of those opportunities in today's market analysis. Let's go. All right, so here we are in the live scene. We do have a lot to talk about. We have traditionals pulled up, but we will start with cryptocurrency today as we are wont to do. Let's get over here and look at the crypto markets. Bitcoin trading at 9,088.50, Ethereum over at 238.76, XRP holding above 24 cents, EOS struggling to get above $4, Litecoin going nice and easy above $60. Uh, Binance still moving to the upside here above $20. We talked about that. Matic having a 10% pullback today and Origin Protocol we talked about yesterday moving up, up about 6% on my OG and trade thus so far. So let's get right into Bitcoin. All right, so it is the end of the week. It is Friday. We won't be back until Monday. So make sure to follow us over there on Twitter and Instagram to stay up to date over the weekend. Subscribe to the channel so you see the breaking Bitcoin bits. But let's get right into the monthly. On the monthly, there's just a few things that we need to be watching for. We laid out these levels uh, last, or excuse me, last time we talked about the monthly chart, which was on Monday. Uh, so for the monthly chart, there are only two levels of supply and demand that I'm watching. The first is the level of supply stretching from 92.42 to 10,148. The other is the level of demand stretching from 69.28 to 59.20. Now, 59.20 is misleading, but we'll get into that here in a little bit. But overall, my bias on this is as follows. Breaking 92.42 puts us back into the distribution range, trading back into the distribution range. And should we not reject from that, again, overcoming 10,148, uh, even so, would be quite a strong sign. The fact that we have already corrected 50% on February's retracement, which was not a 50% correction of January's pump, is actually a good sign. We are holding bullish levels so far quite stably. Again, I talked about not losing 8,200 as very important because that would forestall for me a descent back into our level of demand down at around 6,900. I don't really want to see price go down there. That's going to be the fourth monthly low test. I don't want to see that happen. If that happens, I've talked about the weekly 200 simple moving average, also the monthly 55 exponential moving average. Let's take a gander at that. So, uh, you know, I would I would be worried about retests of those levels. Again, uh, where is our weekly 200 simple moving average sitting right around $5,400, $5,600? Where is our monthly 55 sitting right at $5,438? Do I see price going below there? Do I see Bitcoin's price going below there? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So should we, in the worst case scenario for the holders right now, have a nice, re or not a nice, but kind of a dramatic retest of these lows? I don't actually expect them to hold. I do expect that if Bitcoin's price comes down and retests this low, these lows for us to expect the worst case scenario of 5438. Now that isn't happening right now, but I just want to lay out these levels so that investors who are sitting on the sidelines who want to take advantage of what might possibly be the last dip in Bitcoin for quite a while to be able to capitalize on that event. Now we are still above major moving averages on the monthly, above the eight, above the 13, and above the 21 exponential moving averages here on the monthly. Always a good sign to see. We can see that February's sell off was simply a retest of major moving average support. And so far, we are responding positively to that. Now the volume is not fantastic, but the volume was also not fantastic on February sell off. It was not conclusive. You can see if you look at the monthly chart, if you go back and look at previous sell offs, volume. Uh, on sell-off candles or, re or retracement candles that lead to more significant corrections, the volume is often quite high. And February did not represent that. The volume was quite low. So overall, the movement to the downside, the investor sentiment to the downside was really not there. It was just a retracement responding somewhat reactionarily to the global markets is my overall opinion. So 92.42, an important level to overcome here on the monthly. That puts us back into the supply range, the distribution range, where we sold off back here at the apex of 2019's bullish pump. Puts us back in that $800 range, $1,000 range, let's say between $9,000 and $10,000. Now, can we range in there for quite a while while we gather steam to break to the upside yes but remember whenever we consolidate near resistance that is a bullish sign and this is largely monthly consolidation we've had a nice retrace we've come right back up to the top weak movements this is overall consolidation consolidation at resistance is bullish to the upside generally consolidation around support is generally bearish because we typically break to the downside on high momentum and high volatility so um Let's keep that in mind. Overall, monthly is looking good. There's not a lot here. There's not a trade signal here. 
there is sentiment to have our eyes looking to the upside, and we have levels that we need to be watching to make sure they don't get broken to the downside, which would be leading us into more sustained shorts. Of course, we'll be doing this on the daily so that we can actually be more active and profitable with our trading. But as far as overall sentiment in the market, this would be leaning bullish, absolutely. Let's go over to the weekly. Take a look at those levels again. Again, the only thing that we'll talk about here as far as chart patterns is the breakout of the descending channel that Bitcoin was trading in. We've come back and had a nice rounded retest of that level, indicating this area right here around the $7,900 to $8,200 level. Again, on Wix, our potential buying opportunities. After we've had this rounded retest, again, as always, I'm a trend following trader, so I don't, I don't trade reversals. Uh, the daily trend is still currently bearish, meaning that we are not actually in the market to be looking for at-risk leveraged long positions. I am spot long on Bitcoin. The macro on the weekly is still bullish. So we just need to hold that. Again, remember that we are in a no-trade zone on the weekly until we overcome our previous highs. Now, there is one other level over here. And to, for this to make sense, I do want to stay on the weekly here. And I'm going to go back, as I always do, to the peak of our all-time high back in 2017. And we'll look at volume profile fixed, uh, volume profile fixed. Now, look, we are in the, again, this just massive chunk. And I've talked about this range before. It's a wide range. It stretches from 6,000 to 9,000. And you can see it is a massive high volume node on Bitcoin using the volume profile. And what that represents, in my opinion, is the fair market price of Bitcoin. Bitcoin currently, again, it is a highly volatile asset. It is a new asset. It is in the early centuries of price discovery, for the love of God, the early centuries of price discovery, the first century of its price discovery. So uh, this stuff takes a while to pan out. Many markets have had decades if not centuries, to find some sort of fair market value, whether we're talking about commodities or whatever. Uh, but Bitcoin is in this very volatile range of price discovery. So six to 9,000 for me represents a fair price, let's say, for Bitcoin. Obviously, you get a deal if you can buy it toward the lower end of that range, and you get a, uh, you know, obviously you get a worse deal if you buy it toward the upper area of that range. But overall, this area represents the area, the, the range, where investors feel comfortable with Bitcoin's price. They feel that Bitcoin is fairly valued between six to $9,000. That's a wide range. It's a wide range. But for Bitcoin's long-term future and where Bitcoin has appreciated from, it's actually a pretty tight range relatively, okay? Uh, if you look at the percentage percentages that Bitcoin has appreciated by from where it's come and look at the range that it's trading in now, it's actually pretty thin when you put it into perspective. Uh, so we can see that that high volume node really ends right around 12,000, right? Above that, above that is low volume train tracks. And what do what does price represented in this analogy as a train do when it leaves the train station, which is represented in this analogy as a high volume node and gets into low volume node territory? Well, it tears, right? It either goes up and comes right back down. That's a stop loss hunt or a grab for liquidity. This is an institutional investor play. Or it continues to tear because the, the, there's there's no there's no friction on the tracks it's just grease it's grease lightning so <laughs> getting above the twelve thousand dollar areas sustainably on weekly closes on daily closes is what we want to be seeing uh, when we're looking at potential parabolic movements okay uh but right now you can see on the weekly we're coming right up and testing the lower area of that resistance zone that that supply zone right this is where we sold off uh, from recently this is where we sold off the last time coming off the apex of the 2019 pump uh, and so this is a fairly critical area where we're at so again safest thing is for most investors most traders to be largely sitting on the sidelines looking for these macro movements if they have not already positioned themselves and waiting for these strong trending signals that we have established momentum that we have established trend and that we are acting as a hedge that we are getting the hurting effect as investors flee traditional markets and run into Bitcoin. That's what we want to see. We want to see the money going out of the traditional markets come into Bitcoin, and then we want that to accelerate. We want the hurting effect. When you guys are looking for these large parabolic movements, that is the sort of macro fundamental event that can kick that sort of thing off. And even if we take that off of the table, we want to see significant levels broken, right? So anyways, uh, that's about all we got going here on the weekly. Looking at the weekly moving averages, Again, I do have, I think, again, incorrectly, the EMA instead of the SMA. Uh, so weekly SMA setting at 54.84, amazing confluence with the 55 monthly. Again, I think that would represent basically the lower boundary of Bitcoin's price right now. Should we lose 8,200, uh, particularly uh, should we lose 8,200? That's the area that I would expect a significant retest of because that would necessitate a losing of the weekly 55 uh, and so on and so forth. 
Okay. Uh, now let's get down to our tradable time frame, which will be the daily. All right, so loading up the breaking Bitcoin indicator, we can see we are still in a no trade zone, but things are starting to look positive for us. We are still in a bearish we are still in bearish territory being below the daily baseline now we do need to get above 93.82 now it was 94 yesterday it's 93.82 it continues to dynamically move down with price we do need to get above that level for us to be looking for trending longs to the upside above the continuation filter so we are strictly in a no trade zone on the daily closing below 87.42 would have me looking for at-risk shorts at this point based on the trend <clears throat> so would minx cross unders so would bearish signals from any of my initiators now taking a look at our indicators right here we can actually see minx crossing above the zero line and beginning to turn green this is going to be traditionally a long signal however if you have minx set to your baseline it will not signal it will not give you a long signal until you cross and close above that baseline and that's what minx is waiting on here for but momentum moving into the upside minx agreeing with that confirming that if we take a look at parallax which is our other confirming trending indicator we are still in bearish territory now one interesting thing to point out here on parallax remember we've said this many many times overbought conditions in bitcoin don't matter oversold do and we can see here from parallax does have overbought oversold conditions we do descend into oversold and have recovered which does test fantastically as an exit indicator now of course we utilized bottom feeder our algorithmic bottom finding strategy to actually exit our positions and enter into a risk long down here in the lows that we averaged into over this this and this day last week that trade is now completed so i do not have leveraged at risk exposure to bitcoin i'm just spot long i'm just spot long um so, but Parallax is still bearish as it is below the zero line there. So when it crosses over, we'll continue to get another bullish signal. Looking at Wada Atar explosion, unfortunately, we still have a couple of things here. Falling volatility, overall smoothed out and averaged, and negative volume delta. Negative volume delta. So we do not have a bullish signal here from Wada Atar. As I said, guys, we do have some work to do to reestablish the bullish trend and get all cylinders firing for trending long signals. And remember, when we're in trending long territory, trades on any time frame that you want to take to the upside have a much higher probability of success so overall no trade zone potential level of resistance coming up to right now remember the most critical level of resistance currently right now is going to be right around 9381 9200 to 9381 which is going to represent the lower boundary of our demand of excuse me of our supply range and also where the daily baseline is cruising down on price right so we can expect there is a potential reversal baseline bounce uh trade right in that range if you want to set a limit sell order to market short bitcoin that would make sense it, you are trading in the direction of the trend because the baseline is moving down price is bearish the candlesticks are red um uh, if you're waiting for a confirmation trade for a recontinuation of the trending short and you don't want to take a reversal within the trend which is the only type of reversals that we take reversals in the direction of the trend which right now would be trades entered to the short side then you would want to be waiting for price to close below 87.42 or for your initiator or continuation indicator to give you a continuation signal which minx is not doing right now in fact minx moving the opposite direction um so current game plan is to wait for the close above 9304 uh, or to look potentially on lower time frames for overbought opportunities in that area to go short from. So let's look at other time frames here on Bitcoin. 12 hour time frame still has not given us the confirmed long signal yet. However, our uh, Parallax, our confirmer, has flipped bullish on the previous 12 hour candle close. We can see that right here. We are now 12 hours past that. But if we look at Wadatar explosion, we're not getting that signal yet. Now, interesting to note here on the 12 hour, if we do get a nice bullish candle, in, in this case, breaking above, probably closing above 9,200, we're probably going to get rising explosion level because look at how far the explosion level has fallen. We are getting down into that kind of consolidation area where the bands, the Bollinger bands are tightening up and it's not going to take much to get those bands expanding again and get that nice trending signal to the upside. Again, here on the 12 hour, is that really what you should be doing? No, you should be looking to trade in the direction of the trend and the daily trend is bearish. So as we can see, Minx curling to the downside. We're not in overbought territory yet, so the opportunity does not exist here on the 12th. What does the four hour say? All right, the four hour, as we talked about yesterday, gave us three winners, one loser so far on the four hour time frame, utilizing the PTP strategy. Where did we get overbought? Right in this area right here on... Uh, on Minx right here, we get the take profit long signal on this candle, and we get the exit signal for longs from the breaking Bitcoin indicator right here. Again, potentially setting us up 
for a short, especially again, remember this is like the three screen trading method where you're looking at the daily, you're establishing that the daily trend is bearish, and then you're going down to the meso time frames and you're waiting until your momentum oscillators get overbought to consider that an opportunity to short, right? If the daily trend is bearish, you wait on the meso time frames for your oscillators to get overbought. That means that price is extended too much to the upside, sets you up for a potential shorting opportunity. Uh, now, now full confirmation again on the four hour will come if we close below the four hour uh, baseline here. So we need to get below, uh, we need to close below 8,900 to kind of confirm that. So that's going to be kind of early signaling uh, as opposed to the daily, which needs us below 8,742. Now we can see Parallax flipped bullish over here. It's been bullish for quite a while, about to descend back down below. Parallax being bearish, uh, closing back below the four hour baseline. Uh, getting some negative volume delta from Wadatar, which is not doing that yet. And Minx, we can see, is heading down below the zero line. So potentially, we are going to be setting up for a four-hour short if we get a movement in that direction. But we need to get some, we need to get some selling pressure coming in. Right now, I'm not seeing it. Uh, so that's about it for Bitcoin. Getting into Ethereum. Uh, again, uh, Ethereum on the daily time frame having a more positive move than Bitcoin. Much more powerful candle today than Bitcoin. Trading at 237.75. Looking at the breaking Bitcoin indicator. That's Quadrigo, sorry. Looking at the breaking Bitcoin indicator. Again, same kind of scenario here. Uh, Ethereum has more work to do than Bitcoin to reestablish the bullish trend. We do need to get above 263.65 to be above the baseline. Uh, we are above the continuation filter, so strictly in a no trade zone right now on the daily, and the daily trend is bearish. Uh, nothing else significant really here to point out. Again, on the 12 hour time frame, Parallax flipping bullish on the current 12 hour candle close. Ming signaling for the for the uh, long over here, breaking Bitcoin indicator, giving the long signal right here. And we do not have rising explosion level from Wadatar explosion. Again, very similar to Bitcoin. Maybe one more bullish candle or a little bit more of a march could flip us up there. Potential 12 hour long opportunities. But down on the four hour time frame, again, we've had three winning trades on Ethereum. Uh, one here one here and one that was set up for us right here that actually would still be incomplete uh, so far. Continuation long signal right here from Minx with Parallax bullish and Wadatar explosion confirmation. Uh, so Wadatar is still signaling the price is bullish. We still have positive volume delta with the rising explosion level. Uh, the level to lose on the four hour kind of as an early indication uh, that we are going to be looking at a break in trend and for price to start listing to the downside is going to be around 230. Four hour close below 230. Um, is probably likely to not make our indicators flip short here, but we'll just have to kind of watch and monitor the systems. Again, all the members in the premium group are familiar with how to utilize these strategies uh, on the on the different time frames, all in the educational material. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, there's not an opportunity currently on Bitcoin, or excuse me, on Ethereum. The only thing for Ethereum is this potential four hour long that you would still be in. Price moved to the upside. Let's actually see if that did hit our first take profit. Uh, yes, actually, excuse me, it did. So that four hour signal uh, would have moved up, hit your first take profit here. Uh, you've probably, you have likely been stopped out at break even. So you are now flat and waiting for your next continuation signal. And with Minx crossing down below the trigger line, you are starting to get set up because you need Minx to cross back above the trigger line. So what I would see, what, I, what I'm kind of looking for overall here, looking at the four hour is for, you know, price to kind of uh, excuse me, consolidate here for a little bit on the four hour, maybe for the rest of the day. Uh, it is third, uh, excuse me, it is Friday. So Friday is typically a bullish day. Friday is typically a positive returning day for cryptocurrency markets. So again, we could see a little bit of a deviation from this, uh, but getting set up for that cross under, which will set us up for price to cross back over. So maybe waiting for another four to eight hours, maybe a signal this evening, a continuation long signal that will be, as we can see here from Minx, we never reached the overbought territory. Maybe we'll be getting into the overbought territory then on the next leg up. So maybe one more profitable long signal from Minx before we're getting kind of set up to take that to take that four hour short in the direction of the daily time frame. Uh, getting to XR. Well, hold on one sec. Let me make sure I put that back on the daily. All right, XRP on the daily time frame, kind of in a very similar situation, trading above 24 cents. We talked about the importance of holding that level, and it is still important to hold that level. So we are above the continuation filter, which was kind of your last signal to be exiting shorts if you were in a short position on XRP. Uh, to re-enter into a daily short, we do need to clo be closing below 24, excuse me, 23.25. So daily close below 23.25 will be a continuation signal to the downside. We currently have overhead resistance at 26.46, also the same level we need to close above. To signal that the trend is bullish 
to the upside. Looking at our indicators here, we do see declining negative volume delta and a falling explosion level, but still not a bullish sign yet. We do see that Minx has not yet crossed the zero line, but it is marching up there. Of course, that signal will not be valid unless we are above the baseline. Uh, we can see Parallax recovering from oversold conditions as well and recovering. So again, a few reversal opportunities here for the more riskier speculators, uh, but so far, nothing right now. Again, need to get above 2646 in a no trade zone on XRP. Moving down to the 12 hour, again, very similar to Bitcoin and Ethereum. The volatility is just not there. We do not have the signal uh, that there is enough volume, that there is enough volatility to justify taking such a time, such a, such a long time frame signal 12 hour signal is not there to the long side uh minx and parallax have flipped bullish as is what it's our explosion but we do not have that rising explosion level but the 12 hour is beginning to look positive on the four hour we talked about this we had uh two profitable trade setups we would be flat on XRP right now, excuse me, actually, sorry, sorry, that is incorrect. Uh, uh, XRP did just give a continuation long on this candle right here. So we've had two profitable trade setups right here on XRP USD using the four hour PTP system, Minx, Parallax, Baseline, Water Tar Explosion. Um, and uh, you'd currently be in drawdown right now. We are holding above the four hour continuation filter and above the four hour baseline. Minx going below zero, Parallax going below zero would be invalidations or early exit signals as we're closing below the baseline at this point in time. So the level we need to hold here on the four hour for the long trade is going to be 2384. Need to hold the four hour above that. Uh, we did briefly tap into over overbought territory right there, but very weak sauce. So actually what I would be expecting to see from here is very similar to Ethereum, maybe another leg to the upside as we kind of get that cross back under again. Minx just crossed back down below the trigger line right here, below the noise line, meaning that we're set up for a recross back up to the upside if price starts to rally right here. So that's kind of what I would be expecting. I'd be expecting another push from XRP here, completing the signal, pushing us into overbought territory and potentially setting us up for a profitable short setup, a reversal within the trend, trading in the direction of the daily time frame. Uh, looking at EOS, rounding out the rest of our Bybit pairs, currently trading at $3.76. The daily trend is bearish. We are below $4.03, which is where we need to overcome to reestablish the bullish trend. So if anything is there, uh, it's EOS. EOS has had a, a, a big sell-off. It's fallen quite a bit in price. It's quite a bit over uh, oversold, in my opinion, on the daily. Could get much more oversold. It's going to follow the rest of the market down. You're not going to see Bitcoin, Ethereum, and XRP sell off and EOS start to pump randomly for some reason. That's just not going to happen. Um, but watching this, kind of looking at EOS as an early indicator, I don't think so. I think that it's just the least valued of the four major pairs over here on Bybit. But I digress. Uh, so we do need to get above $4.03 or to signal for a long, or we do need to get below $3.58 to have a continuation signal for a short because we are strictly in a no trade zone right now. Looking at our indicators, we can see that on the day, uh, excuse me, on the daily, Minx is also uh, is poking its head above the zero line, Parallax still below the zero line. Uh, and we can see here on Parallax, we did not even get oversold, which is very interesting to see, right? We can see that Parallax, which is probably the best smooth trending indicator that we might have, uh, didn't even get oversold on the coin that was oversold the most. It's been sold off the most. So potentially an early warning signal that we do have more downside incoming, at least for EOS again, which would foretell more downside for the rest of the market. Still negative volume Delta from water Atari explosion. Uh, so what do we need to see here on the daily? We need to see Parallax. We need to, we need to see some work. First off, we need to see price above $4 and three cents. Uh, so of course we are, uh, coming to that level of resistance. So setting us up for a potential reversal baseline bounce short opportunity down here on the 12 hour again we can see water tar explosion struggling to put in the volatility required to be signaling for a 12 hour long even with minx parallax and the baseline turning bullish again water is there to protect us and it's just not there yet on the four hour time frame uh we've had one two profitable trade setups on eos usd on the four hour time frame utilizing the ptp strategy uh and uh and overall uh um uh, actually the best return. So just looking at the volatility, Bitcoin, Ether, um, XRP, and EOS, EOS has been the uh, best asset giving the best returns on 4-hour PTP strategy since February 28th. So just over the last week or two of trading, uh, really the last week, so 28 plus 5 is 7. Anyways, um, uh, let's take a gander here. 4-hour is actually still bullish. We are pulling back a little bit. We need to hold above $3.72 to maintain that bullish bias. Closing back below that would be a potential shorting signal. We never quite reached those overbought conditions. We did here, 
We did here, but only for one candle. So again, a potential shorting opportunity on this candle right here or on this take profit long signal from Minx, which was a fairly good take profit long signal. So we've had this setup, this setup, currently no signal from Minx. What we'd be watching for on Minx is for Minx to cross back over to the upside. Uh, and with everything the way that it is, that would be signaling for a continuation long. Or we would be looking for about another eight hours for price to close back to the downside. And we might be getting a four hour trending signal to trade in the direction of the trend, which is bearish, which I would be looking to take. I'd be looking to take that trade setup. All right, Litecoin 62.32, same thing. Uh, on Litecoin, we need to get above seventy dollars, or we need for uh, to, to confirm uh, trending longs in a no trade zone, or we need to close below fifty nine sixty one to be signaling for more at risk shorts. Uh, Binance. Uh, is attempting to is currently testing and tested actually rejected from the daily baseline, which is sitting it right around. Uh, excuse me, where do we where do we run up to today? What is the high today? Twenty one seventy six. Uh, we can see that the baseline was actually sitting at twenty two nineteen, so almost made it to the baseline. Rejected a little bit early. Uh, we need to get above twenty two nineteen to be signaling for longs, or we need to close below nineteen oh eight to be signaling for shorts. And taking a look here at BNB, we did have some nice uh, appreciation of the upside. And looking at our indicators, what do we see here? Yeah, we did reach a nice, look at that, a nice frothy overbought level for quite a while here, really setting you up for a nice short. And you did have uh, the market come back and try to stop you out. Excuse me, but if you would have held that position, excuse me, if you would have held that position, uh, right here, taking advantage of this kind of reversal setup, three screen method, uh, you would have been set up for it, what might be a potentially uh, profitable shorting opportunity. Currently right now, just following PTP methodology strictly by the letter, uh, you've had one losing trade. Let's see here. Let's see here, one losing trade, one profitable trade, and a second profitable trade. So two winners, one loser, and you are currently, let's see here. Yeah, you are currently in a position right here, signaling for a continuation long right here. That'll be invalidated if Minx crosses below zero, if Parallax crosses below zero, or if we get, uh, if we get um, price closing below $20.83. So again, uh, overall sentiment and bias that I'm kind of seeing from looking at all the meso timeframes today is that price can have a kind of last push to the upside and potentially be putting us into an opportunity for shorting. Uh, in the direction of the daily trend. Uh, Matic, again, kind of moving early, having a nice pullback that comes off the heels of a very nice rally. All right. Uh, so Matic, let's take a look at the, sorry, take a look at the indicators here. We did reach the overbought level. We are curling back down. Minx is giving the cross under. Some are going to be viewing this as a take profit signal. Uh, this trade would technically still be valid as long as we are above 2338. Uh, roughly, we're also going to be hitting our break even stop loss at that point in time. So we've already secured profit right up around 27 cents. Actually, two, excuse me, uh, not point, not 0.27 cents, so 2.7 cents. Uh, on Matic with our first TP out 50%, holding the other 50% of our position for either our break even stop loss or for price to continue to rally here and move to the upside. Looking at the 12 hour, we have we, are, we have just gotten the exit signal on the 12 hour and on the four hour, we got the exit signal on the previous four hour candle close with our indicators beginning to flip bearish. So potentially an early warning sign for those who are utilizing multiple time frames to monitor their trade. Again, another successful trade for us in the group. Uh, and Origin Protocol finally making a nice movement in our direction uh, after holding through the drawdown yesterday. Again, moving us into the profit. And let's take a gander here. Not hitting our first take profit yet. So still holding Origin open for further profits. Again, daily is beginning to look good. Confirmer flipping bullish. Wadatar explosion, rising explosion level. Minx is looking quite good here. And of course, we're holding the baseline quite well with very limited information. Uh, excuse me. Breaking Bitcoin. Holding our, uh, holding our continuation filter quite nicely because we do not have as much data. I took less risk. I took half of the risk that I normally take on a trade for origin because we don't have as much historical data uh, to backtest and establish systems met methodology on. So overall, pretty exciting day in the market. We're going to look at the major movers of the day. Before we do that, 
Let's take a look at traditional markets. SPY currently down at 294.87, attempting to recover a little bit after a very, very large gap down this morning. Same on the QQQ, looking at the NASDAQ, and same over there on the Dow Jones. We can see the healthcare sector holding up okay. Bentley crude, I mean, just falling through the floor. Look at Bentley crude right here. Anybody that's trading, uh, anybody that's trading, for example, the Gush ETF just got their faces ripped off. And anybody trading the Drip ETF, as I've been recommending for a week now, is, uh, I don't know, probably looking to retire. So this is the inverse ETF. If you guys want to short oil and you're an American and you don't have access to the CFDs like BCO and you don't want to trade the underlying, again, what I recommend is the DRIP ETF. Uh, it's an inverse ETF for you guys to get exposure and it's 3x leveraged. So you're going to get some nice exposure. Take that into account when, when you're position sizing. Uh, but again, soaring today as Bentley crude continues to respond negatively to the OPEC meetings and to the overall global illness that's spreading around us. And again, looking at this through the lens of PTP, uh, this is fairly clear. Initial short signal right here. Nice pullback, reversal baseline bounce setup and further descent, right? Further descent, further descent. So beautiful signals coming in here. Uh, again, Parallax flipping bearish right here and doing exactly what we want it to. So beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff to see there from Bentley Crude. Big winner in traditionals for me today. Looking at the SPY. Give you guys an update on the levels. SPY has closed below the continuation filter, which is technically a continuation signal for shorts, uh, letting us know that we can potentially view, look for more downside incoming. Again, getting a continuation short signal from Minx on the daily. And of course, Parallax still bearish, rising explosion level, rising volatility from water to our explosion. So overall, this is letting us know the price that the SPY, the traditional markets are still quite bearish and are signaling right now the failure of traditional markets. So current level to overcome to invalidate that bias is 306.77. If we get the SPY closing the daily above 306.77, it will invalidate that. And if we can get above $3.20, the SPY will recover its bullish trend. But until then and until there, I'm going to be bearish. So again, talked about SH, talked about SDS, a lot of things to do. All right. Um, and again, the NASDAQ and the Dow following right along with it. Uh, let's take a look at gold spot. All right. Zooming out, taking a look at gold spot, uh, you know, gold spot attempting to reach for its previous highs again after that whoop, whoop, loopy doop down to the downside. And we talked about this, we talked about this with the baseline indicator. We talked about the no trade signal. Make sure we have both of them on, right? Talked, uh, talked about the no trade signal right here. Talked about the no trade signal right here, but it kept you out of trouble. And then we talked about the validation of the trade signal right here. So we talked about that potential long on gold as it occurred, when it happened. Uh, let's look at our indicators here. Again, getting the long signal from Parallax and from Minx on this same candle, getting full confirmation from water tar explosion on this candle right here, letting us know that the volume and volatility is there. Now putting in this big screw you doji on the daily on gold, but again, the indicators are pointing to the upside and further appreciation on gold. Looking at current price targets, we'd be looking for overhead of 17, 1730, 1760 initially. Uh, hard stop and validation at 1626 and an, and an early invalidation should we close now below 1630. So really, again, our stop loss is almost perfectly placed right there. Stop loss is almost perfectly placed right there. So I think the gold is worth a shot at these levels. Silver, on the other hand, is not quite there yet. If we look at silver spot, this is the CFD over on Awanda. We are below the baseline. We did reject from $17.70, which is where our baseline was positioned at. Big, again, similar screw you doji with a larger body than gold spot today. We are in a no trade zone on silver. Closing below $16.94 will be signaling for another short. We can see the previous short signal that we got on silver right here, setting us up for one of the biggest trades on silver that we could have had, a 6.22% movement in one day on silver underlying. Again, not silver underlying, but silver silver spot. Uh, so big move into the downside on silver. Uh, rallying again over the past week. Closing above the continuation filter here and putting us in a no trade zone. So silver is bullish above $17.70. We'll potentially be signaling for at-risk longs. But if we look at our indicators right now, again, all of our indicators are still bearish. We did get the take profit short signal and the exit from the continuation. But we do need to close above 1770 to be bullish. Or if we close below 1694 or put in any sort of momentum short signal, we're going to be looking for silver shorts, unfortunately.
All right. Um, let's go to. Uh, let's see. We talked about. We haven't talked about Ren yet, but let's go to Crypto Bubbles. Look at our big movers of the day. Big movers of the daily are going to be HBAR, Hedera Hashgraph, still looking strong on the daily. Uh, looking at junior analyst Jason System, uh, had a PTP long on March 2nd and would currently be hitting take profit one today. Now, it is currently too overextended to look to take a trending position, but we could be watching HBAR again, as we said yesterday, for continuation opportunities. HBAR with a market capitalization of $182 million, about 20,000 Bitcoin, and a daily trading volume of 38.8 million dollars. Supply of about 3.3 billion, total supply of about 50 billion coming in on HBAR. Let's take a look at the chart real quick. Uh, looking at the USDT pair on the daily, very large surge to the upside. Now, uh, if we look at the daily of Hedera Hashgraph, uh, for me anyways, uh, we are going to be potentially getting a trending long signal. We've had this nice, long, stretched out consolidation, nice moving to the upside in retrospect. Uh, we can see, again, a little bit better here if we take out the previous pumps because things become better in perspective with the logarithmic chart on. Now, for my system, we need to close above 5.448 cents, so 0 0.05 Four four eight is where we need to close above. Watatar explosion has turned bullish today. Uh, Parallax is not quite there. We have not closed above the zero line. Uh, Minx is bullish, stretching into the overbought territory, so that's fine. So overall, on the daily, I would be watching this for continuation going into next week. On the 12 hour, we can see we got the 12 hour signal right here, which we've got you in for this very nice, beautiful pump per PTP methodology, getting a 12 hour continuation long here and a pullback. Uh, but of course, just following the system would have actually gotten you in when you were supposed to on this candle. And then on the four hour, we've had a few profitable trade setups here. This one right here. Actually, sorry, we could enter it here and we would have held that for TP right here and then out here and then back in on this candle, on this candle. So the four hours setting you up, 12 hours setting you up as well, both for that big move, catching that big movement right here on H bar USDT. A little low, uh, again, not quite there yet on the daily. Let's watch this and see if we continue to get follow through. All right, moving on to our next big mover of the day is gonna be Ziliqua. Zil looks great here on the daily, according to Jason's analysis. Now we do need to watch it at the daily close, but it looks as though Zil may be a long signal if it closes at current price, which was 70, uh, 77 sats at the time of his writing, looking at the BTC pair, and it would be firing a full risk long signal. Ziliqua, by the way, uh, stay tuned. Coming out next week will likely be potentially our interview with Ziliqua. Uh, so I had an opportunity to sit down with Ziliqua and speak to them. So about a $70 million market capitalization, 24 hour of trading volume of 18 million, 18.6 million. So pretty frothy over there, 9.9 .9 billion circulating supply of Ziliqua, 13.24 billion total supply. So definitely pr uh, plenty out there to get your hands on. Uh, taking a look at Zil USDT for me anyways. Uh, looking at Ziliqua USDT, it's not quite there on the daily. We can see here that Minx has crossed to the upside. We can see the Watatar explosion is starting to poke a bullish column up there. Parallax has yet to flip to the bull side. And we do need to close above 0 0.00711 to be getting the long signal or to be in bullish territory on Ziliqua. We're actually right now in a no trade zone. And if anything, setting up for a reversal baseline bounce. Again, I am more prone to take those on BTC US, or excuse me, BTC Ethereum, uh, EOS and XRP. Uh, and because those are what I'm comfortable utilizing margin to short sell, not so much coins like Silica because altcoins tend to just move in one main direction, right? either up or down with high volatility and high momentum. So, you know, coming kind of coming out of this nice contraction period, we are going to get some expanding volatility coming in here. So let's watch to see if we can get above those seven, seven, excuse me, seven tenths of one cent level 0 0.00711 to be getting this trending long signal on Ziliqua. Again, not quite there for me. According to Jason, the BTC pair is saying something different. So potentially one could be looking at that if they prefer trading BTC pairs. I prefer trading US dollar tether pairs. Our second big mover of the day is Aragon ANT. We covered ANT yesterday, talking about it, and it is getting some nice follow through today. Uh, so shout out to the, to uh, to Aragon there. It does look strong on the daily. It's remaining bullish, according to Jason's analysis, above the baseline today, potentially representing a Minx crossover to the upside, triggering a continuation long at today's close, possibly. So one to keep on your watch list at tonight's close to look for confirmation. Market capitalization of 45.5 million USD. 24 hour volume of $180,661. So not as much volume there on ARN. So one to take into account if you have a larger capital equity, definitely take that circular, excuse me, 
daily trading volume with a large movement today into account when you are position sizing. Again, less liquidity means you have to take a smaller position size or you're going to move the market if you're a big boy. All right. Uh, and looking briefly at ANT for me, uh, do we have a dollar tether pair? We don't. We're going to have to look at the BTC pair. Uh, ANT BTC over on Bittrex. Uh, looking at ANT on the daily on Bittrex, we can see the initial long signal right here on the daily for ANT, catching this movement right here. Nice pullback. And when we get the continuation long signal right here, catching this movement right here. And for me anyways, I don't see the continuation signal yet. So we're going to need uh, one to put on your watch list for sure, because that continuation long signal has been gold. And we can see the initial long signal again here, PTP. We can see the continuation long signal here. And uh, again, looking for that second uh, continuation long. So Aragon's been performing quite well over here, ANT BTC on Bitrix. So one to put on your watch list and watch for that next signal to the upside. Okay, uh, that's going to take care of the major markets for us. Um, we've got a lot to cover uh, in today's cryptocurrency segment. We've got some news that we're going to break down today. Uh, we're going to take a brief break right before the show. We'll be back in just about 60 seconds. So grab a coffee, light up a cigarette, uh, you know, slide that leverage slider over to the right, do whatever it is that you do. Of course, if you are enjoying the content, make sure to smash up the like button, guys. Subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, turn on all notifications because subscriptions don't really work here on YouTube. Uh, and if you're over there on DLive or Twitch, consider giving us a follow or subscribing. Help support the channel. Um, otherwise, make sure to check the description out. There are links in there for a wide multitude of things that you guys might find will improve the quality of your trading life. We'll be right back in just a minute. Make sure to let us know if you have any questions or comments on today's analysis or what you would like to see, chart requests, all of that. Put them in the chat. The moderators will direct my attention to them, and I will be answering questions here in just about 15 or 20 minutes, guys. So see you in just a second. I hit the wrong button. Now, our first story of the day comes to us from the Daily Hoddle, and we're going to be talking about Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong and his recent comments. Now, Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong has made comments recently suggesting that Bitcoin might be surpassed in the future 
by other digital coins as the crypto industry continues to mature and evolve. Now, I know, I know, I hear the hisses and the boos, and trust me, I am right beside you, but let's see what he has to say and at least try to understand where he's coming from a little bit here. Now, describing, let's look at his Twitter, describing his crypto industry forecast in a series of tweets, Armstrong highlighted interesting parallels between the development of the early internet and cryptocurrency. And although this is an argument that we have hashed out many times on the channel, let's do it again, because there's nothing like redundancy beating you over the head with the same information to make sure it gets through there. Now, the challenges, he says, faced by early adopters and developers of modern telecommunication and internet technology are comparable to the issues of the new crypto industry, or excuse me, is comparable to the issues that the new crypto industry is dealing with. So, so quoting him here, at Netscape, they were working with early internet protocols. Things weren't very scalable, dial-up modems. You had to uh, be somewhat technical to figure out how to get online, and early websites were pretty basic. Static sites locked, looked like toys. Does this sound familiar to crypto at all? They figured they'd try to making a shopping cart, see if they could build a first-party app. There was no way to save state or create a session, for instance, to make a shopping cart, so they created the concept of cookies. And the next problem was that nobody wanted to put a credit card into the internet because everything went plain text over uh, HTTP. So they went and invented SSL, HTTPS, end quote. Now, interesting to note there, interesting to note there, I don't know if you guys remember Mosaic. Mosaic was the first browser to ever introduce pictures and text in the same browser, and internet usage increased 1,000% after the launch of Mosaic back in 1993. But Mosaic, with that massive launch, was overtaken by another internet browser just one month later, which was Internet Explorer. Now, Internet Explorer lost its dominance to Netscape there briefly, uh, which had a much better package, much better user interface back at that time. Then we got into 19, obviously 1993 to 19. 99, there was this massive tech boom uh, where, again, investors were kind of taught that, hey, don't worry about things like profitability or, you know, sustainability. Just invest in anything that's got a dot com. If you guys remember, pets.com paid millions of dollars to make a talking sock puppet, a national mascot that nobody had ever heard before uh, during the Super Bowl. And then two months later, filed for bankruptcy. Uh, so uh, because, you know, America went into recession by 2002. So. Anyways, um, what's interesting to note there, by the way, is that Y2K actually um, did not cause the uh, tech crash. It actually, um, uh, the, the Y2K fears made people run out and buy a whole bunch of computers and stock up and, 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 and really uh, kind of accelerated the movement to the upside. But the NASDAQ hitting insane levels, insane levels that took years, years to recover. Um, so anyways, Getting back to Brian Armstrong here, and I just wanted to have that brief deluge about Netscape, but Armstrong explains that just like the early internet pioneers that came up with new web tool solutions, like we just talked about, SSL, HTTPS, cookies, uh, you know, the barely decade old crypto industry will develop next generation innovations. Yeah, it's called lightning. Now, he describes slow internet speeds and dial-up modems as equivalent to the challenges faced today in scaling blockchains and development of encryption solutions such as SSL and HTTPS are similar to what privacy coins are trying to accomplish now. Right, yeah, Lightning has private transactions. Now, according to Armstrong, the two major features that digital coins will need to address in order for them to reach mass adoption are one, scalability. So he says that we need blockchains that can get to at least thousands of transactions per second to get mainstream adoption of cryptocurrency. So similar to broadband internet being a big unlock on the web, which led to a big unlock called TikTok. Yeah, that was me. Two, privacy. Now, this is perhaps a contrarian view, he says, but he thinks that we will need privacy coins just like we needed HTTPS and SSL as the default on the, on the web for many use cases in cryptocurrency long-term. Everyone deserves access to financial services and financial privacy. Okay. Now I can certainly see that. I can certainly see that again, lightning has private transactions. Now, as far as the transactions per second, uh, my argument would be here is that Bitcoin does not need that on the base layer. Uh, there are already, there's already innovation that's being done on second layer solutions for this. Uh, I don't think that Bitcoin itself as the uh, as the main chain needs to ever hit that sort of transactions per second, because I am going to side with the uh, settlement argument 
Uh, if you haven't heard of that, definitely pick up the Bitcoin Standard by Safety and Amos. It really will open your mind and show you what Bitcoin is truly designed to do and really kind of break down and divide and educate you on this whole store of value, medium of exchange argument that the big blockers, you know, wanted to go down that rat hole when they split off back in August. Long may they rest in ashes. Now, um, as far as... Right. So Bitcoin does not Bitcoin as a main chain does not need to scale, does not need to do all these transactions per second. And something like the Lightning Network is fully capable of handling that. But again, uh, we already have. Listen, we already have these payment solutions. We already have these. We already have Visa, uh, v uh, uh, Venmo, PayPal. All those can be settled in Bitcoin. So this idea that we need to reinvent uh, some sort of network that will handle transactions per second, uh, I think, is not correct. I think that this can. Uh, we can use the existing infrastructure of Visa, MasterCard, Venmo, PayPal, all the stuff that already exists there. And instead of settling them by privatized centralized banks um, through United States dollars, uh, where settlement can take up to weeks, we can settle them on the Bitcoin blockchain end of week, end of month, end of year, and it'll take 10 minutes. So it's the settlement and the security that is absolutely important. Everybody that's already transacting is already using currently uh, third party intermediaries to basically hold their transactions in a personal, centralized, private ledger that is private to the bank or the financial institution. Now, I don't think that that's where we want to be long term. Bitcoin does solve this problem long term. But obviously, the first step is just taking existing infrastructure, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Venmo, and having that settled on blockchain. That's all that's all we need to do. We have the infrastructure. We don't need to worry about that right now. I do not get this argument where people think that we have to uh, have Bitcoin compete with Visa right now? No, Bitcoin can supplement Visa right now. You just have Visa transactions settled on the blockchain at the end of the week or at the end of the tra at the end of the day. This is very easy because it doesn't matter really the size of the transaction uh, for Bitcoin to be settled in. Uh, that's largely irrelevant. I mean, you know, we might if we're talking about trillions, trillions dollars, the network scale. So. Um, Right. So just putting my two cents in there, I think that we do not need to focus on transactions per second. I think that that's silly. I think that we need to focus on settlement right now and bootstrapping Bitcoin to be the settlement layer for current existing infrastructure. And once we have that done, then we're going to have so much innovation, so much development happening in Bitcoin that, I mean, your your eyes will roll back in your head. These things will come so fast because the demand for them will be there. Right. So, again, this is not Keynesian economics. Uh, the government does not create demand. Um you cannot artificially create demand. The demand has to exist in a free market. And then innovation occurs because entrepreneurs step in to take advantage of those inefficiencies in the market. This is how value is created. So now getting back to Brian with scalability and privacy being two weak points of early blockchain technology, such as Bitcoin, Armstrong feels that there is a major opportunity for next generation blockchain projects to eventually become the dominant crypto assets of the future. Uh, so again, you know, again, kind of siding with this argument that, well, what Bitcoin should be focusing on right now, look at what these other chains are doing. And again, I don't know. Uh, I don't know a priori what's going to happen in the future. I don't know what the free market is going to value if they're going to value settlement, which I think that people who are like more forward thinking and believe in hard sound money and, the you know, how critical that is to um, a productive society. Uh, is so Bitcoin there is my priority because I think that that's the most important thing to do right now. Um, other people might, you know, over prioritize these fancy bits and bobs and really, you know, recreating uh, the current financial infrastructure on the blockchain, which Ethereum is already trying to do with DeFi. And I fully support that. I think that's awesome, man, because you can move so easily between Bitcoin and Ethereum. So, you know, hold your value in Bitcoin. And if you want to take advantage of things like loans and and tokenization and all that stuff. Well, Ethereum's already doing that on Ethereum's blockchain, right? And I think that eventually that will be done on Bitcoin's blockchain. So, but, but you know, I, I digress. So in conclusion, um, from Brian Armstrong, you know, Brian Armstrong's conclusion is that I, that he thinks that it's still pretty much up in the air. What blockchain is going to get help for, uh, is going to help crypto get from 50 million users to 5 billion. Uh, the chain that manages to ship, sh to ship, some of these scalability, privacy, and decentralized identity solutions, as well as developer tool solutions, SDKs, and things of that nature, will have a big leg up. And I certainly don't disagree with him from there. Making development easy for those who want to participate in the ecosystem, having SDKs and easily downloadable development tools, that's absolutely critical. But again, we'll go back to the free market uh, standpoint here. When the demand is there from the market, then the innovation comes. The innovation comes, right? So Lightning, uh, Lightning development is proceeding along beautifully. A lot of projects are are proceeding along beautifully with our development as well. Ethereum is moving right along with Ethereum 2.0 set to launch this year. So I fully support all of these projects, but I think that the idea that um, 
what what needs to be prioritized is recreating Visa on the blockchain is what's going to make it instantly scale or excuse me, what's going to make it instantly reach mass consumer demand. I don't think it's going to happen. I think that there's going to be a demand for sound money. And then that is going to drive innovation because money will be flowing into Bitcoin. Just listen, how many blockchains launched in 2018 after the massive run up of Bitcoin and altcoins in 2016? So for Bitcoin and altcoins so from 2016 to 2017, and then altcoins had that massive pump at the beginning of 2018, right? So how many blockchains, how much innovation, how much development was done in 2018? More than had ever been done on an exponential level relative to what had been done in cryptocurrency before. Why? Because there was all this money sloshing around, right? So exactly the same thing. When when there is demand for hard and sound money, which Bitcoin is, and that demand starts to flow into Bitcoin at a very fast rate, the money will be there, the demand will be there for innovation uh, and development of new goods and services. That's how it happens. You do not artificially create demand by trying to predict what the market wants. You can, of course, uh, and, and, and companies do this and some have success, most don't. Um, but what you really do, the more successful entrepreneurs respond or reactive to demand that is currently existing, right? And they try to get first in. So I think that's... Uh, I think that's how that'll go down. That's my personal opinion. Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Do you stand on the side of Brian Armstrong? It's really up in the air, which it really is. I'm definitely not disagreeing with him on that one. Or do you feel that uh, there is kind of a more clear vision and a way forward? All right. Please let me know in the comment section down below. Uh, second story of the day, last story of the day, it's going to be on our friend, Jack Dorsey. Now, uh, according to etcmanager.com. Uh, Twitter's loss could be Bitcoin and Square's gain. By the way, 50% of Twitter's income, or excuse me, not Twitter's income, 50, they wish, 50% of Square Cash's income, Square, owner of the Cash App, developer of the Cash App, 50% uh, of their monthly revenue comes from Bitcoin now. So woohoo, shout out to you, Square Cash. They are, you're in now. We got the claws in you, brother. You're not going anywhere. Now, in a bid to implement major changes over at Twitter, the hedge fund, Elliott Management, has secured a 4% stake in the company this week. Now, Elliott Management's founder is Paul Singer. Uh, he is now in the midst of a battle with Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, who he believes, um, uh, you know, who he believes is, you know, kind of holding Twitter, you know, in his role as part time CEO. Now, so in a recent Forbes report titled Jack Dorsey has a new nemesis, hedge fund billionaire Paul Singer. I don't think I have the link to the Forbes article. Uh, I don't have the link to the Forbes article. Probably right here. Ah, it's right here. Here we go. Uh, so yeah, so in this uh, Forbes article uh, detailing how this is all broken down, these links will be in the description down below. Uh, why are you advertising this list? I don't want this. No, go away. Stop doing it. There we go. Okay, it went away. Uh, <laughs> it's going to creep down on me. I just know it. <coughs> now, this Forbes article describes how Dorsey has been splitting his time with Square and Twitter and that his departure from Twitter may ultimately be a win for Square as well as for Bitcoin. Now, of course, many people credit Twitter and Square as having important roles in this sort of grassroots, uh, this, this grassroots movement uh, for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general. Now, Twitter is one of the leading platforms for cryptocurrency news and discussion, while Square's Cash App has, to some degree, brought Bitcoin adoption to the masses. That's, I recommend Square Cash for people I meet on the streets if they want to grab Bitcoin super easy. Now, with Jack Dorsey being one of the space's most prominent supporters, as well as promoting its use, Bitcoin's use, through business ventures, his departure from Twitter on the insistence of Elliott Management and their newly acquired stake could actually be quite a good thing for Bitcoin by directing more of Dorsey's attention toward his adventures in fintech. Now, while many consider Twitter to have taken a Bitcoin maximalist position and a generally crypto-friendly attitude, thanks to the CEO's stance, Dorsey's departure could mean that Twitter's internal stance on crypto could shift, though, resulting in the social media platform becoming more hostile toward the industry. Now, I'll give you guys an update. Of course, you guys are familiar with Project Blue Sky. Uh, which was uh, designed, which is intended to be an open and decentralized standard for social media proposed by Dorsey last year for Twitter to adopt. Now, with this kind of shakeup, it's unknown what the future of the project will be and if senior management at Twitter is on board at all or will be moving forward with Elliott Management's influence. So with Dorsey kind of canned from Twitter, uh, he would have more time to dedicate to Square, moving him up to full-time CEO of Square. And 
potentially overseeing more crypto related initiatives at that company. And this may help move adoption along with the payment app having recently announced funding for Bitcoin developers to help with the company bootstrapping Lightning Network usage. Go, baby. Now, Lightning adoption is, as with a lot of mainstream adoption for cryptocurrency apps, is struggling along with everything else. And a push would help. And an established player on the level of payment giant Square and their cash app could help bring that vision to life. Now, Lightning, as with a lot of uh, apps uh, applications, this is not unique to Lightning. With low adoption and limited usage, many feel that Lightning to date has not lived up to the promise of helping boost adoption through scaling Bitcoin. Now, we just covered this when we were talking about, you know, uh, organic demand from the marketplace. However, Bitcoin supporters are still bullish on the prospects for Lightning, as they should be, especially with several value added protocols launching and ongoing improvements to user experience. Again, development and continuing at a very fast pace on Lightning. Now, meaning that Lightning still has a very strong chance to shine, particularly if Dorsey makes it a priority item on Square's roadmap and dedicates valuable development resources to its development. So what do you guys think? Is Dorsey our guy? Is him getting canned from Twitter a good thing for getting more of his attention on fintech development? Do you think Dorsey is a believer in the Lightning Network and could help boost its development? Or do you think the Lightning is not critical to Bitcoin's success in other integrations into payment processors like the Cash App or institutional custody solutions are going to be the more attractive way forward. Please let me know in the comment section down below. And that does conclude today's cryptocurrency segment. Let's get back to the live scene to run through your questions and answers live. Let's go. And uh, you know what, guys? Let's do a big chest. It's Friday. Let's go, baby. Let's throw some more. Let's throw some more lemons in the basket. Uh, ruling bug, thank you so much for the follow over there on D Live, my friend. Let's swing back up here a little bit. Dark Rico, thank you for the lemon. Robin from the hood, change I O. Thank you for the lemons, guys. Uh, Depai guy, thank you for the lemons, my good friend. All right, let's do it, guys. Let's distribute these rewards. All right, so the first thing I want to go over is um, actually LTO. Now, junior analyst Jason has been scalping this uh, up, down, left, right, and sideways, pulling a ton, just, I mean, extracting all the profit that one could profitably extract from this. Uh, some fantastic setups over here on the 15-minute time frame. Now, Jason's using a slightly different setup than me, but just looking at it through my lens, I can see, well, just scrolling back over here, I can see, I mean, one, two, three, four, Nope, five, six, six setups uh, since, I mean, since the, since the fifth, since, since yesterday. So very fantastic pick of coin here for Jason. Uh, he has bit, he has pulled 10% on this over the past day, over the course of four scalps. Uh, if you guys want to see that now, Jason does post all of his signals public in our discord. You guys can go to crack or excuse me, discord.crackingcryptocurrency.com. Link is in the description down below or it's discord.crackingcryptocurrency.com if there's no description down below because you're watching us on DLive or Twitch. And you guys can see all that in the Midwest Attempts channel. Make sure to definitely go check that out. Uh, now, uh, Boris Bitcoin asking me to take a look at the SKF ProShares Ultra Short Financials and the uh, MSCI Emerging Markets Bear 3X. Sure, man, let's go take a look. Uh, so we're going to look at SKF. This is post-revenue split. Uh, very nice. Moving to the moving to the downside again. This is a non-leveraged ETF for shorting the. What do we got here? Yep, yeah, post rest. Okay. Um, first thing I want to do is kind of get a zoom out and look at what we're doing. Uh, I mean, again, if you ever saw a breakout chart, baby, look at this, man. Look at that. Just like if we do control I, what is it, Altai? Yeah, that looks like a breakdown, right? Look at the S&P 500. All right, anyways, 
It's looking pretty good. Looking pretty good objectively, just looking at the daily. All right, so let's bring up the breaking Bitcoin indicator. Again, smash, very similar to the S, uh, to the SPY signaling for a continuation short today, signaling for a continuation long on the daily. Uh, and we can see it, Parallax firing in all cylinders right here. We did come back down below the continuation filter right here and consolidated a little bit. Uh, and now we just have closed above on the daily, above the continuation filter at 1756. Rising explosion level from water tar explosion. Powerful signal from water tar explosion. Rising green columns. Continuation long signal on the daily. Parallax bullish and flipping to the upside. This is a good sign to see. So let's take a look at uh, potential TPs. This would be pointing us up at 1832, 1909, and 1985. Invalidation at 1641. No more than 2% risk per trade. Uh, and early invalidation, sorry, let's turn that trade qualifier off. Uh, early invalidation, should we close below 1584? 1584 seems to be where it's at, but of course, our SL would be hit there. But longs would be invalidated below 1584. Anyways, so of course, make sure to view this through your own system. Make sure this is not an incentivization to take any sort of position, just an analysis of the chart and make sure that it aligns with your own analysis. Uh, but to me, that looks good. Again, very similar to SPY. You know, uh, the, you know, it's it's very, some people can be intimidated by seeing these big gaps and signaling for a trade, but where is the volume headed? Where is the market moving? You know, this is not, you know, this is not like a retest and then a rejection, right? This is like, oh, we had a correction and now we want to keep going in that direction. It's pretty clear to me. Uh, and taking a look at EDZ. See which one you want to look at. Okay. Uh, EDZ is the same thing, man. EDZ signaling for a continuation long on the daily. Holding strong above the baseline. Volume looks very good here. Continuation long signal from Minx. Parallax is bullish. Uh, invalidation below $40.90. We would be looking, for me, I'd be looking at this around $47.51 to $52.21 to the upside. With the stop loss at 41.63. Let's check in over here on DLive. Big winners of the day. Squeaky Tad pulled the pie guy. Midwest attempts. Ricky T and Dark Rico. Thank you guys so much for the support over there on DLive, my friends. Uh, Crypto Rick. I'm Crypto Rick. <laughs> Sorry. Um... He says, hi, Justin, what have I found to be more profitable trading Forex and crypto and by how much? Thanks. Well, I mean, obviously trading cryptocurrency, right? I have made, let me put this into, let me put this into account. I made money. So I, I make money consistently trading Forex um, and some months are greater than others. Uh, but cryptocurrency, I mean, is, is insanely volatile. I mean, I've made, you know, just, just being, you know, honest, I mean, cryptocurrency is, has put in these big two, three, four, 500% returns. I mean, yeah, I've, I've made, I've made more money in cryptocurrency than in Forex. Now, moving forward, what do I think will be consistent? Well, we know this, right? We have, you know, we have like 20 years of active market data, um, really good active market data on Forex, right? And that market is, you know, very professional, very efficient, very liquid. And so moving forward, what do I think is going to be more consistent? Of course, Forex. It's been consistent a lot longer. There, there are times when it's just kind of overall unattractive to trade cryptocurrency. There are those times where you're just, that's why we use the system that we do, where we look at the chart and we're like, there's nothing to do here. And so, you know, this always kind of gives me a giggle when sometimes, listen, sometimes there, it, it, there's like that. We'll go through a few days where there's not a trade. There's just nothing to take. Sometimes there's whole periods where there's nothing to do except hold our shorts or hold our longs, right? Especially if, if Bitcoin's bearish and we're really tumbling down there, I mean, you know, we opened up our shorts when we were supposed to, and we just hold those things, right? We're not, you know, we're not going to go down to the 15 minutes chart and scalp altcoins, altcoins to the upside if the big movements are Bitcoin just tumbling to the downside. It's the, the risk to reward ratio is not there. Meanwhile, we can go over to Forex where there's uncorrelated markets and we can trade long, we can trade short, depending on what the markets tell us to do. So I think that a combination of the two is great for consistent results for really diversifying. Um, it reduces your risk. It gives you access to other tools, other markets, you know, challenges you as an investor, challenges you as a trader on portfolio management and portfolio allocation. Also incentivizes you to think long term and start, you know, making investments on top of being a trader, which uh, again, uh, generally long term investments are what's going to make you the biggest returns in the long run. So, you know, again, like I, I will never make as much money in my life being a trader um, as well, I mean, I could if I wanted to take a lot, a lot of assets under management, which I don't want to. Uh, but 
um, then you know if I would have just put a ton of money in uh, in 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 Bitcoin back in 2013 and just held that baby right and sold in December 2000, you know you know what I'm saying like this is even now. So you know long you know and again some of the biggest returns in my life have been three four five year holds right some holds that I'm still holding right I've been investing for the last ten years so. So again, I think the best, listen, cryptocurrency is beautiful, right? I think that people should be trading crypto. It's highly, it, it's the, the good markets are highly liquid. Uh, you know, there's a lot of freedom, very low fees, very low friction, very low barrier to entry and great returns, great returns with a good consistent approach. Um, but people who only trade crypto, I think will underperform on average and on annum those who are more diversified, right? So those who are also trading Forex, uh, those who are also trading CFDs or ETFs or individual stocks, maybe some options, you know, you really want to start expanding your options out there. And that's that's the way, that's the direction we're moving in as a group as well. Like we've been focusing on crypto for the last several years. We're integrating, we've integrated Forex now and we're doing that more actively. We'll be integrating CFDs and ETFs to really A, appeal to everybody and give them a good diversified approach to the market, right? So we just continue to grow and and i'm really excited and I'm, I'm just really happy to be able to be here every day and providing this advice and analysis and to just you know i've made the decisions that i've made in my life that allow me to to do this so uh yeah i think that crypto is probably you know pound for pound more profitable but i think that a uh, diversified approach is pound for pound more consistent um All right. Sorry. Let me go see. What was the next question here from Beckham from, excuse me, from Peckham. Bend it like Peckham. Justin, can I have your opinion on NFT? Just curious from a professional. So Morgan Stanley International. Whoops. Sorry, guys. I pressed the wrong button. So you need to tell me if you're talking about the Nifty. Uh, Morgan Stanley Multinational Co. also trans under NFT. You could be talking about nutrient film technology. If you're trying to prepare for the illness. <laughs> Does that make me pound for pound heavyweight chain? Just put some money on a Wanda. Definitely going to lose it all within three hours. Uh, can I apply my system for crypto to Forex? Yeah, it's absolutely seamless. Oh, okay. Non-fungible tokens, right? Non-fungible tokens. So Ethereum non-fungible tokens. Like, so property creation and um things of that nature um listen so i'm not I'm, I'm certainly not an ethereum expert okay i know quite a bit about ethereum i probably know more than most uh but you know there, there's a lot that i don't know about ethereum um so having said that let's shoot okay listen so I have reservations about the security of proof of stake. Okay. Uh, I have reservations about the security of proof of stake. I do not have reservations about the security of proof of work. So I'm a little concerned with Ethereum moving to proof of stake. I support them in doing that. I think that if that's what they want to do, which obviously they, they do, that that's, that's, that's why they're, that's why they're doing what they're doing. Um, then there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I support them in that movement. I really do, uh, you know, kind of support DeFi 
and um you know all that all that's all that's occurring over there and i think that ethereum is helping bootstrap decentralized exchanges with things like uniswap really leading it really killing it over there uniswap having more volume than binance dex which is which is kind of cool to see um you know truly decentralized overcoming somewhat decentralized you know what i'm saying um as far as non-fungible tokens like if you're talking about if you're talking about like property stored on the blockchain as far as you know tokenizing securities or tokenize, tokenizing you know physical properties or tokenizing you know uh human labor human capital you know i think that this is a really cool concept i mean there's a lot of cool things that are occurring over there uh you know for example i know that this uh shirt designer uh he you know he tokenized his human labor and then um he tokenized his human labor and then uh, you know, you know, basically sold his token off and then people bought his token up and like cash that in for his labor, which is which was pretty cool to see. Um, I think that in the future, having some sort of global standard for things like deeds and bills and assignment of ownership and all of this stuff. I mean, it seems like a no brainer now, whether it's going to take the whether it's going to take the um, like the road, like the route that it's currently on right now, like if it's going to be Ethereum and we really are going to tokenize everything on the Ethereum blockchain. I mean, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I doubt it. I think that if anything, that would happen on Bitcoin's blockchain, but maybe we, maybe again, maybe we just keep Bitcoin as sound money and uh, we tokenize other things. Um, <coughs> uh, so overall, my kind of thoughts on that movement are that I think that's really cool. I think that the idea is correct for how we move forward. And I think that one should be participating in that ecosystem. Uh, but I wouldn't be putting your house on a blockchain right now. I mean, come on, let's be realistic, right? Like let these things be tested, right? Um, within games like F1 Delta, I think they're cool, man. I, I like the idea. Um, I, I like this idea of, you know, incentivizing and rewarding individuals to participate in an ecosystem ethically and honestly. And so naturally, you know, in-game tokens can, you know, uh, be exchanged for in-game prizes. I mean, that's a no brainer, right? You're incentivizing people to participate in the ecosystem. And it's better if you're smart and you reward these tokens for contributing to the ecosystem, right? So I think that's a that's, that's a no brainer. You know, of course, that comes with the regular caveats um, in general. Uh, so if we're talking about games, uh, you know, all things in moderation. Uh, my only kind of reservation about that is that video games are already highly addictive and probably one of the biggest reasons that young men um, are being less productive than they could uh, because they're spending a lot of their time playing video games instead of being an entrepreneur or studying or learning things. These are just my personal reservations about people to play a lot of video games. So this isn't an indictment on you or, or the space. I think that from an entrepreneurial point of view, it absolutely makes sense. And I like the fact that it can be done um, on a blockchain that is as immutable as humanly possible. So that's cool. Uh, I think it makes sense for the developer. I think it makes sense for the ecosystem. I think that we just want to be educating ourselves that, whoa, this is really cool, but having that whole environment and ecosystem can really suck you in where you're like stacking up all these NFTs that may or may not be exchangeable for a whole lot of cash, right? But again, there's another thing, right? Like, yeah, I'm probably going to get like hated for this, but there's this uh, concept from Sword Art, Online, Sword Art Online, the second one, which I had to sit through. Uh, it's actually not that bad. Listen, I'm not a big fan of Sword Art Online, but it's not that bad. Okay, it's enjoyable to watch the first time. Right? I only watched it once. Um, uh, but where these people playing this gun gala online... Uh, you know, get paid. And we can see that with Twitch and DLive and streamers getting big sponsorships and, and payments. So, you know, potentially this is an opportunity for people who want to play competitive esports uh, to not have to rely on sponsorships or, you know, being a, a likable personality on Twitch, right? Because that is kind of a barrier, right? People, sh if you want to, if people should be rewarded for by being a good gamer or whatever, uh, and they can earn these in-game NFTs, and then actually cash those in for something that is valuable because maybe, you know, just like we have the black market for World of Warcraft or stuff like that, right? Where people sell, you know, in-game items on, you know, it's StarCraft 2 and World of Warcraft and all these in-game games, right? Counter-Strike and whatever, right? Uh, that black market already exists. Um, so, you know, legitimizing it and allowing individuals to just earn these NFTs for their skill or performance inside the game or their contribute to the ecosystem and then cash those out for real money. Hey, you know, maybe that's... Uh, you know, maybe that's um, maybe that's a good idea, right? So something to think about, you know, definitely not something I've delved huge into in my brain box, but good question, man. Good question. With that being said, guys, time to head for the exit.
I want to thank all of you guys for joining me for another Friday TGIF episode of Breaking Bitcoin Market Analysis. My name is Justin Wise, lead analyst and senior mentor here at CrackingCryptocurrency.com. I hope you guys have an absolutely fantastic weekend. I want you to trade safely, manage risk, test your systems, trust your systems, follow the systems. You guys need to put the work in to build them first. And weekends represent an excellent opportunity for those of you who are planning to go out with friends and party to take a step back and realize this is the craziest time in the market right now. And I could be doing so much. So sit down, build those systems out, back test, forward test, get it done, guys, put the work in because these opportunities don't exist forever, right? So uh, that being said, uh, if you guys enjoy the content, make sure to subscribe to this channel here on YouTube, hit the bell icon, turn on all notifications. You know, that's what you want to do. But if you don't turn on all notifications, they're not going to let you know when we go live because subscriptions do not matter here on YouTube, except for to help support the channel. And of course, make sure to subscribe and follow us over on Twitter and Instagram. All the other socials are right here. Links in the description for everything you could possibly need. If you're watching on DLive or Twitch, consider giving us a follow or subscription. It does help boost the channel. Thank you guys so much for the support. I think that's everything. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, sarcastic remarks, or death threats, please leave them in the comment section down below, and I will respond to them within the next 24 to 48 hours. That being said, again, please trade safely. Be awesome. Do something excellent this week. Hell, do something excellent today, man. You know, you only have right now. Your life is your life. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. Long-term thinking. Let's do this, guys. Much love. And I will see you guys back here on Monday, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. So make sure to join us tomorrow night for movie night in the Discord where we're going to watch. I think we're going to continue watching The Mandalorian. So make sure to join us there. Kicking off at around 7 p.m. Excuse me, around 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Make sure to follow the, uh, the Ann channel in our Discord for an update on that. I'll see you guys on Monday. Be awesome this weekend. Cheers.